The Bible tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It says to receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls, and to be diligent to present yourself approved to God, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Join us now for the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. Our study today is Preparation for the End Time. Hello and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I'm Jill Morricone and we are delighted that you have taken this time as we open up the Word of God and study together. If you've been following with us every week, we just finished our study on stewardship and we're ready for a brand new quarter, preparation for the end time. One of my favorite promises is Jesus giving this promise to his disciples right before he went to the cross. I'm speaking of John 14 verses one through three. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Mm -hmm. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. As Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we believe in the literal, visible, audible and imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. This quarter we'll study the prophecies of his coming, Daniel and Revelation, the three angels messages, the soon return of Jesus. And we look at all that in the context of how are you, how am I, how are we to be prepared for his coming? Right now I wanna to introduce to you our panel. We have Pastor C.A. Murray, Mr. Danny Shelton, Miss Molly Steenson, and Miss Shelley Quinn. And it's a privilege to share with each one of you to hear what God has given to you and to open up the Word of God and to study together. Thank you for having us. It's a blessing to share together. Before we go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And Pastor C.A., would you like to lead us in prayer? Be glad to. Father God, how thankful we are for your Word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We are thankful for the study of the Word mm -hmm. and that we never leave the study of your Word, mm -hmm. but that we are refreshed, inspired, enlightened, encouraged, and given strength to take one more step along that road that leads to glory. We ask that you may be the center and circumference of all that we say and do today, mm -hmm. so that as we speak, you will speak to us and speak through us so that your people may indeed hear a word from the Lord. We surrender ourselves to you and thank you for what you've promised to do in answer to the prayer of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you would like your own copy of the Sabbath School Quarterly as we study together, you can always visit your Seventh-day Adventist church and they'll give you a copy of the quarterly. Or you can go to the website. That's A B. SG. That stands for Adult Bible Study Guide. .org, and you can download the copy and follow along with us as we study together. This quarterly was written by Norman Gully. He's a research professor in systematic theology at the Southern Adventist University. And I'm just excited to, to share together on preparation for the end times. Lesson number one is on the cosmic controversy. When I grew up, Mr. Danny, we just called it the great controversy. Right. Mm -hmm. The battle between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. Mm -hmm. I think the great controversy is all about character. God's character as it is, as it were, on trial, how he clears his name mm -hmm. of false charges. And the great controversy is all about choice. Our choice, your choice at home in this battle, who we're going to serve. So let's look at our memory. Memory text, we're in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, and we'll read it together. And you at home can join with us, Revelation 12, verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. I think I learned that in King James, so you kind of want to yeah. say the remnant of her seed yeah, yeah. <laughs> instead of the rest of her offspring. Yeah. On Sunday, we look at the fall of a perfect being, and you know, I like stories. I like reading stories, I like writing stories, and all good stories have three parts, a beginning, 
a middle, mm -hmm. and an end. And you think about this thing called the Great Controversy. And the beginning of the Great Controversy began with war in heaven. And we'll look at that, how sin originated in heaven and how sin originated on earth. The middle of this whole battle is you and I and the decisions that we make all throughout history. The great controversy has, has been raging, you could say, and the decisions we make either for or against Jesus Christ. But we know the ending of the great controversy and what is that ending, Mr. Danny? You always say we read the back of the book. Read the back of the book and we win. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> and so we know that is how it's going to end. So Sunday, I look at the fall of a perfect being. We're going to look at two different scriptures, Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. So turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel 28. We're going to start there. Ezekiel 28, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me again saying, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre. Mm -hmm. Now prince in Hebrew means leader, ruler, or prince. And the literal prince of Tyre, now we can have another application to this. And when we get to verse 11, there's going to be a supernatural application to this. But the literal prince of Tyre at the time when Ezekiel wrote was probably Ithobael III. And he was known for his wisdom. We see that in verse three, behold, you are wiser than Daniel. Hmm. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. He was also known for his wealth. We see that in the next verse. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasure. He was also known for his pride. We see that in the next verse. By your great wisdom and trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. He was also known for his claim to be divine. We see that in verse two. Because your heart is lifted up, there's that pride again. And you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not a God, though you set your heart as the heart of a God. And we see the end of him in verse eight, it says he will be thrown down to the pit and slain, shall die the death of the slain. Now we look again at, instead of the prince of Tyre, now the Bible shifts in verse 11 and we look at the king of Tyre. Let's look at that, uh, Ezekiel 28 verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. Now we're shifting from an earthly ruler and it's almost as if the curtain is pulled behind and we're taking a look into heaven as it were. Mm -hmm. And let's look at the, the qualities of this being, this angelic being. We see this in verse two. Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. And it goes on with what the stones were. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. So we know this being was perfect. He possessed wisdom. He had beauty. He had status. He had musical ability. And we also know, Shelley, he was created because it said it was prepared for yeah. you in the day you were created. Mm -hmm. Now let's look more, verse 14 tells us more about him. You were anointed cherub, so now we know he's an angel. You were anointed cherub who covers. In Hebrew, the word for covers means to overshadow, to screen or to cover. So this angel, was almost right next to God himself and was covering or screening the glory of God from the other angels. So this is a high angel that we're talking about here, an exalted angel. It says, I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones in the very presence of God. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. This angelic being was perfect till iniquity mm -hmm. was found in you. The word for iniquity in Hebrew means injustice. So this being began to harbor in his heart a false belief that God was unjust. 
and then he started to spread, as it were, this false belief. You know, anything you believe really strongly, you start to disseminate. You start to share with someone else. If you believe in something passionately enough, you start to share it. And this being did that. And verse 16, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with the violence within. Now, if I read that, I just think, okay, he traded. But what it really means is to go about from one to another, trading in goods or words. Mm -hmm. Slander, you could take the word slander if you look at it in the Hebrew. So this being, this created being who was right next to God himself, he began to go from one person to the next, starting to slander the character of God. And pretty soon, it got a little more heated. We see that in Revelation 12, and I know others will be touching on that, the war that broke out in heaven over this. And then it says, therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stone. So this angel was cast out of heaven. And why did that take place? Let's look in our remaining time at Isaiah chapter 14. We'll jump back a couple chapters to Isaiah chapter 14. Now this being is mentioned outright in Isaiah chapter 14 as Lucifer. It says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. And then it goes on with five I statements, as it were. And we see the sin of Lucifer from the very beginning was pride. And I came up with five P's that he's guilty of, and they all, it's, it's all related to pride. It is position, power, preeminence, prestige, and peer. And we'll unpack That's that good. here. Good. The five P's of pride that we see in Satan. Mm -hmm. Verse 13, we're in Isaiah 14, verse 13. You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. That's number one. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That's number two. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. Remember, whoever was on the north was, was God, so he wanted that place. Number four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Remember, clouds represented the Shekinah glory in the tabernacle. When the cloud came down, the presence of the Lord came down and descended, so he wanted the glory mm -hmm. that was given to God. Mm -hmm. And then I will be like the Most High. So those five eyes, we say, I will ascend in to heaven. He, he wanted position. I will occupy heaven. Number two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. The stars meaning the angels. He wanted power. I will exercise authority. Number three, I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. I will have all in subjection to me. That's preeminence. He wanted to be preeminent. Number four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Remember, clouds represented that glory. He wanted prestige. He wanted to possess God's glory for himself. And then number five, I will be like the Most High. I will be like God. Mm. He wanted to be an equal with God, to be considered a peer with God. Now, how sin began in the beginning I have no idea. You know, to even understand how a perfect being entertained thoughts of the injustice of God and then began to spread that as slander, that's something I don't even know if the human mind can comprehend, but we know that it originated in heaven and then it came down to the earth. And Pastor C.A., you have that with the origin of sin here on earth. Indeed. Um, thank you, Joe. Well done. Beautiful. Um, on Monday, we take a look at more than a head knowledge. And this is almost a parenthetical insert into this process, but it is, it is extremely necessary because that which we see at the beginning in Eden, we also see rearing its head in the church today. Mm. As we come closer to the second coming of Christ, what is evident is that a head knowledge of these things mm -hmm. will not suffice, mm -hmm. one, to keep us away from sin, mm -hmm. but two, to put us 
in a position where we can be faithful to the word of God. Amen. So in Eden, we see at the beginning of time that a head knowledge was not sufficient. Mm -hmm. And as we approach the coming of the Lord, again, a head knowledge will not be sufficient. Mm -hmm. The lesson says, though we cannot explain why evil arose since no justification for it exists, scripture reveals that it began in the heart of Lucifer, as you, as you said, Jill, in heaven. Um, so what is sin? What is this thing that began in the very presence of God in heaven? Well, the standard and perhaps the most basic definition is 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the transgression of the law. Yes. Hamatia, missing the mark, yep. is anomia, in the Greek, which is lawlessness. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty good place to start. Douglas Cooper, in his book, Living God's Love, says that sin, and he's talking about individual sin in our lives, is really a failure to love God supremely. Mm. Whenever good. you that's determine to, to, to do something that's against God, that's you are saying, in effect, I love that more than I love God. Mm -hmm. And he says, all sin, all individual sin, is really a manifestation of your love of that thing more than you love God. Okay. Because if you loved God more, you'd serve God. Mm -hmm. And we, we kind of see this in, uh, in what happened in Eden. Sin, to my mind, I'm going to toss a word in here, is an interloper. <laughs> now, what is an interloper? An interloper is a person or thing that is exerted, inserted into a place where it does not belong yeah. and is not wanted. Okay. That's sin. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. doesn't belong here and surely isn't wanted. Amen? Even okay. though we practice it, Paul All says, right. I, I'm at war with myself. I don't want it, but I do it. Yeah. So it doesn't belong here, and we've been wrestling with this for 7,000 years. And yeah. praise God, soon that wrestling will be over. Mm -hmm. um, the lesson alludes to, and I want to take a moment just to read this, and, and, and it's going to take a little bit of my time, but I think this is very important. Great controversy in the origin of sin I'm beginning at page 492, um, and I think this is something that we can take to our classes. Ellen White says this, to many minds, the origin of sin and the reason for its existence are a source of great perplexity. Mm -hmm. They see the work of evil with its terrible results of woe and desolation, and they question how all this can exist under the sovereignty of one who is infinite in wisdom, infinite in power and in love. So how can yeah. a God of love countenance this thing in his universe? Here is a mystery of which we can find no explanation. There are those who in their inquiries concerning the existence of sin endeavor to search into that which God has never revealed. Mm -hmm. Hence, they find no solution for their difficulties as such are activated by a disposition of doubt and cavil. Now I have to go back and find out what cavil, C-A-V-I-L, because that has sort of slipped mm -hmm. from the English language. Caviling means petty and unnecessary objections. Okay. Petty and unnecessary. Yeah. So there are some people who pick at stuff that God says, leave no. that alone. No. Don't pick at that. <laughs> leave it as like a little so you keep picking at it, picking at it. Leave it alone. That's, that's caviling. Uh, they seize upon this as an excuse for rejecting the holy words of wit. Since they cannot understand it, they reject it. Yeah. It is impossible to explain the origin of sin so as to give a reason for its existence. You cannot explain it. Sin is an intruder, is the word you use, yeah. who, for whose presence no reason can be given. It is mysterious, unaccountable, to excuse it is to defend it. Mm -hmm. Could excuse for it be found or cause be shown for its existence, it would cease to be sin. Mm. Mm. Our only definition of sin is that given by the word of God. It is the transgression of the law. It is the outworking of a principle at war with the great love, uh, with the great law of love, mm -hmm. which is the foundation of the divine government. Mm. That's the best we can do. Now the lesson asks, as we look at how sin now comes to earth, to discuss the culpability of Adam and Eve in the spreading of sin to the earth. Do they have culpability? Well, the answer is yes. Absolutely. Because Eve 
knew, and this is where this idea of head knowledge and heart knowledge comes. Eve knew what God wanted. And the reason we know she knew <laughs> <laughs> is because of what she said to Satan. Satan said, has God not said that you're not supposed to eat? Yep. Mm -hmm. She said, yeah, God has told us. She, she talked with Satan. Mm -hmm. She explained to him what God had told us. So we go to Genesis chapter one, chapter three, verses one through seven. I just want to look at what Eve said. I mean, Genesis chapter three, Genesis chapter three, here we are. And look at verse two. Genesis three, verse two. And the woman said to the serpent, Eve speaking, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So she was fully conversant with God's prohibitions as to that tree and that fruit. She knew it. She knew it well enough so that she could repeat it to Satan when she was questioned. So she is culpable because she knows in her head what God has said. Yeah. And she, has, she knows it enough to explain it. So Satan says, well, you shall not surely die. This says to me, ladies and gentlemen, head knowledge is not enough. That's, That's right. right. Because God said this, Satan said this, and they chose to go with Satan. Mm -hmm. Having a full knowledge of what God, God's requirements were and what his request was. So this is very, very important. One, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Mm -hmm. uh, um, First Corinthians 8 says knowledge puffs up. It's not enough just to know in your head. You've got to know in your heart. Thank you. You've got to feed, particularly in these last days where everything that you believe as a Christian is going to be tested. Do not think mm -hmm. you will skate into heaven untried and untested. Amen. So it is not enough to have the 2300 days in your head. It's not enough to know about vegetarianism in your head. It's not enough to even know that Jesus died on the cross for you in your head. You've got to know it in your heart. It's got to be part of who you are and what you believe because that will be tested. So um, we have Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, which quotes directly from Isaiah 29, 13. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honor with me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Again, they can talk the talk, maybe even give a pretty good Bible study, mm -hmm. but there's a disconnect as far as what's going on in my heart and in the heart of God. It's got to be more than something that comes out of my mouth. It's got to come from my heart. Mm. In Acts chapter 8, we've got this, this uh, we, we meet Simon the sorcerer. <laughs> Simon the sorcerer. And the Bible says in verse 11, he's been a sorcerer for a long time, serving the devil a long, long time. But uh, verse 13 tells us Simon also believed. Mm -hmm. So he's got it in his head. He believes. Simon saw the saints, Danny, uh, putting their hands on people and the people getting the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, ooh, I like that. <laughs> that. That's a good thing. I think I want some okay. of that. He said, listen, I got a couple bucks. Let me buy some of that Holy Spirit from you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he, be he believes and he wants what he sees. But, but the, the heart connection is not there. Yeah. And, 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 and he had to be told what you're asking, not only... Uh, is it not right? It's not godly. Mm -hmm. you, you, don't, you can't buy the Holy Spirit with money. You don't have enough cash to buy the Holy Spirit. Your bank account isn't deep enough to buy the Holy Spirit. You mm -hmm. don't use the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit uses you. That's right. Okay. So we have this yeah. New Testament example now of a person who, who's got the head knowledge. He's watching. He's watching the people mm -hmm. being saved, and he likes that. But he figures this, that's, that's a cash kind of a deal. And, and, and he's being told, no, no, that's not what we do here. Um, you've got to have this thing in your heart. And if it comes from your heart, then the power will be evident in your life. So, um, again, we do not control the Holy Spirit. Mm. The Holy Spirit controls us. The truth is, the secret to serving God has always been is now and will always be surrender. Amen. Amen. The secret is yeah. surrender. And the power comes from a surrendered life. We don't use the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is pleased 
to use us as we surrender mm -hmm. to Him. Amen. 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 Thank you. Well, I've learned a lot so far. How about, how about you? I feel a little bit like a duck out of water because, you know, I made all of these notes and said, maybe mine is on war in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so Revelation 12, 1 through 17, do I break all of this down? You know, try to go through all of this. Do I leave that to the preachers? What do I do? But it, what the Lord impressed me the other day, I was talking to a group of young people and they asked me some questions and I said, maybe this is what we should talk about today. Good. The young people, when you, we, we're talking about war in heaven. So first of all, they said, well, why would there be war in heaven? <laughs> I mean, why, if God is God, and maybe you've thought about it, you don't have to be a young person, I've thought about it. If God is God, why would he create mm -hmm. an individual that would turn on him? That basically, can't a perfect God create, create a perfect being? Because it said he was perfect. But when we look at the whole picture, of course, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. But mm. when we look at the whole picture of the human race and of God, God had to, there's some things he had, he had to do. He had to create beings that would serve him out of love. Thank you. Otherwise, just create a bunch of robots. Otherwise, just have, a, have people create them as slaves and say, you worship me, you... You praise me. I had a friend one time. He said to me, how can you serve God when he's so selfish? <laughs> I said, well, how's God selfish? He demands that we praise him. He said, what if I went around demanding everybody praise me? They would tell me I was crazy, narcissistic, I'm everything. And why, why can God do that? And I had to think about it. For, for a common sense standpoint and spiritual, I had to think about it. And all of a sudden, it really hit me. And over the years, I've seen it. God inhabits the praises of his people. What God did is he created a beings, even though they were in heaven, knowing Satan would rebel mm -hmm. and that Satan would be cast out to this earth. And it says, as you already covered, he, he drew a third of the angels with him, but he placed man, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God knew that Adam and Eve would fall. Mm. So this war in heaven, and that's the title of ours, the war in heaven, how does this even happen? God in his love for fallen man allowed Satan to do this mm -hmm. because God doesn't demand praise. God is perfect. Mm -hmm. God is love and God is everlasting. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So without the character of God, we will all die. Mm -hmm. His creation would die. So the Lord gives us the Bible. He gives us the 10 commandments. So to see what not to do. <laughs> And, and there are 10 promises, you know, uh, every one of these. I promise you, if you submit and commit your life to me, that you won't want to commit adultery. I promise you, you won't want to steal. You won't want to kill. You won't want to lie and slander. All of these things, God has said, I'm going to make a way out. So what he did in his love for fallen man, and, and Revelation is a revealing of Christ. And I love it because it shows his grace and his love and his mercy. Mm -hmm. So it reveals to us that every bit of this, and you look at the timelines with history of Daniel and Revelation, none of this is by accident. None of it is by happenstance. God has been in control from the very beginning and he will be and always will be in control. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last. So that's who we're serving. So in your life today, when you submit and commit your life to Jesus, you know that God is in control. So the war in heaven, God allowed that to happen. Now it plays out on earth and we have Basically, every story has some characters. So we, we have a, a dragon. Sounds scary. Mm -hmm. we, we have a, a woman, right? We have a man child. Mm -hmm. And so this controversy that started in heaven, God says, I'm going to let it play out. All of the unfallen worlds can watch what happens when people choose sin. So he's not there saying, praise me. I need praise. I need anything. He's telling us, I'm going to, there's rules. I, my character is perfect. And in order for you to live forever, you can't get outside that, mm -hmm. the sin that mm -hmm. Satan did. So in order for you to understand what sin is, I, I'm going to allow this. We're like a theater watching all that goes on. I'm going to let the unfallen world see this so that they will understand what happens when sin comes in yes. to this earth. 
So now we have, what am I going to do? How do I get these people and repair what I've created and bring it back into the perfect character in alignment with my character? Mm. Ah, the plan of salvation. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now they form a plan. Think about this, love, to do all of that when he could easily destroy us or could have just created us to serve him out of fear. But he said, we're going to create a plan of salvation that says this, I love you so much. Yeah. I'm going to come as, a, as, as one of you. I'm going to be born as, in a, as a child on this earth by, by in the flesh, half divine, half, half, half flesh, right? I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to show that it is possible to live a sinless life. Mm -hmm. But then I'm going to shed my blood on the cross of Calvary as an atonement for your sin. Mm -hmm. So when you fail because you are flesh and you are weak and the devil is a great deceiver, he's out to steal, kill and to destroy. He's the father of lies. So when you do fail and when you fall, you can come to me when you're really sorry and say, Lord, please forgive me. He says, I'm faithful and just to forgive you from your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. So we have such a loving God that now we have a plan of salvation, a plan of escape. Isn't that amazing? Yes. That God would give us a plan of ex escape that we now don't have to be. See, everyone on this earth is born. We have a terminal illness, mm -hmm. right? No matter what, we're all happy when we're born. We came in with no teeth and no hair and we go out. Most no of us, no teeth and no <laughs> hair. And it's just kind of, that's, that's, that's the way of life. But God says, I want you to live forever. So all of this, the war in heaven is really started out as spirit, spiritual war, but it ends up being physical in this earth. And we struggle all the time because we fight not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. Yes. But here's the thing. God wins in the end. We talked about it. In heaven, Satan was kicked out. So he came to earth and he said, Satan says, okay, I'm the prince of this earth. I'm going to win this battle. So he goes to Eve, as you talked about, and Eve gave in. Satan says, there's one for me. <laughs> so now the, the man child in the story representing the church, Jesus is born on this earth. And the, the dragon says, I'm going to make war and I'm going to kill him. I will destroy him because I know what's going to happen. But he's born and, and, and though the devil is the beast power, he uses other agencies mm -hmm. and he always has. In this case, King Herod. So they made a plan. I'm going to destroy that, that, that Christ child. Well, it didn't happen. So Satan lost that one. Then the irreversible loss for Satan was at the cross. Absolutely. Yeah. When Jesus gave his shed blood on the cross of Calvary, the, the serpent's head was crushed. It talks about in Genesis was crushed. Satan can't rebound from that. He can't win any other battles. It's literally impossible to do so. So you have the woman who's yeah. the, the, the true church. Yeah. And, and, and now what happens, Satan says, so I'm going to make war with the remnant of God's seed. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, destroy them. But God made a place. And so when Satan attacks them, they spread out. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden we talk about when we go, I think it's 14, 15 and 16, that the earth opened up and helped the woman. So here you have all of these people that, that for hundreds of years, they were hiding during the dark ages when the papacy was in charge, killing millions of people. So for all of these years, they went into hiding. Some in the mountains of Europe, some in, in Africa, some even in Asia. But then about the time that the deadly wound uh, the beast receives in 1798, America became a nation in 1776. Mm -hmm. So what you have is the earth opened up and helped the woman. It's, it's showing the discovery yes. of America. Mm. God knew this thousands of years ago. He didn't let the, <laughs> the Bible writers didn't write it because the papacy didn't want to, they wouldn't have put it in the Bible. They'd have destroyed it. So that's why all the symbols, that's why the beast, the power, the, the seven, you know, the horns and all these, I call it scary monsters <clears throat> that are out there. It's all symbolic, but it's open now for a time. Yes. These books have been opened. So what happens is in the very end, the earth helps the woman. 
the United States of America comes in, comes where people can come and worship God in freedom without fear of persecution. So now Satan is angry. So what does he got to do? He says, I have to destroy these people because once again, once again, they're out freedom and they can spread truth. So Satan, through his deception, he's done away, tries to do away with the Sabbath, uh, the law of God. He's tried to do with the state of the dead, confuse people on all of these things. And yet God says, no, I have a people and Satan it makes war with the remnant church. But God says, I have a people who love not their lives unto death. So you Amen. cannot be a silent Christian. Amen. You cannot be. I, it says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb that we just talked about yeah. and the word of their testimony. Don't think you can be a silent Christian because the word of your te you've got to testify of Jesus and what he has done for you. Jill, as you said, the, the end of the story is when we submit and commit our lives to Jesus, we read the back of the book. Satan is done away with forever, root or branch. Malachi says it's done away and the righteous, those who accept this, Jesus stay close to the cross of Calvary, inherit eternal life. Amen. 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 And well, Danny, you took us all the way from heaven to the end. So did a beautiful job with that. Thank you so much. You know, I've got Wednesday and on Wednesday, I get to deal with one of the greatest promises in the Word of God. Even the title mm. of this is uh, With You Always, mm. Even to the End. What an incredible mm. promise we have in Matthew, the 28th chapter. Now, I want to say this. We're talking about the, the great controversy. That's, that's what we're looking at this week is that great controversy. Controversy, that's war, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's conflict between two. So is there a great controversy going on right mm -hmm. now? Mm -hmm. Well, I want to center in on one small portion of it. And I want to say this, history repeats itself. Have y'all ever heard Absolutely. that? Mm -hmm. History repeats itself. How many of you want to go to heaven? Amen. You want to get, how many of you want the Lord to return? Amen. Amen. All right. Are things pretty bad now in, yes. in the world? Yeah. I've got news for you. Things are going to get a whole lot worse, oh. but then they're going to get a whole lot better. Okay. So yeah. they're going to get a whole lot worse before they get better, but oh, they're going to get better. The book of Revelation foretold, and I want you to go to Revelation. We're going to look at two scriptures in Revelation, the 12th chapter. The book of Revelation foretold the persecution that God's people would face through a good portion of church history. The 1260 prophetic days of Revelation 12, 6 point to 1260 years of persecution against the church. Do we have in history where that took place? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to read the great, a portion out of the great controversy. Now, I would encourage everybody to get a copy of that book. Mm -hmm. If you don't have one, hey, we've got them here at 3 ABN. You call our call center mm -hmm. and That's we right. will make one available to you absolutely free. But, but let me read this to you. Uh, it's on page 40. Sister White tells us, these persecutions beginning with Nero about the time of the martyrdom of Paul continued with greater or less fury for centuries. Mm -hmm. Have you read the uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs? Mm -hmm. Do we know the great controversy, the great, mm -hmm. uh, the things that were done in the name of Christianity? Mm -hmm. It's horrendous. Christians were falsely accused of the most dreadful crimes and declared to be because of great calamities, famines, pestilence, and earthquakes as they became the objects of popular hatred and suspicion, and former stood ready for the sake of gain to betray the innocent. They were condemned as rebels against the empire, as foes of religion and pests to society. Great numbers were thrown to wild beasts and burned alive in the amphitheaters. Mm -hmm. Now, here is what we read in Revelation 12. I've got you in Revelation 12. While this persecution was going on, look what the Word of God says. Revelation 12, verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, Danny covered this, where she has a place prepared by God that they should free, feed her there 
1,260 days. Now, there was a place prepared for the woman. Now, Danny, who, what's the woman? That woman's the true church. The true place. church. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, this is saying that a lot of Christians were persecuted during this time, but y'all, God has always had a remnant people. Amen. He has always kept that remnant. The church was taken care of in the, in the wilderness from all of those forces who were trying. Now, remember, I'm talking about history repeating itself. Mm -hmm. Look at Revelation 12, 14. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place mm -hmm. where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the surface. That great remnant. Do we know that in the end times there is going to be great tribulation? Mm -hmm. And do we know, oh, we want to, we want to be mm -hmm. in, in that overcoming group of believers. Amen. Uh, but there is that great, uh, the great tribulation. But remember the title of this lesson that I have today. There is a great tribulation Amen. that the church is going to have to go through. History will, will repeat itself, but we've got these great promises, which is, I will be with you always. Now, just as surely as there was a place prepared in the, in the beginning, in this that we just read, mm -hmm. during all of that martyrdom that has taken place in our history, there is a place prepared for God's end time people. Amen. Just as surely, history repeating itself. And here is what Jesus said just before he returned to heaven. That's Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Right. So are Good. you going to walk through anything? that the Lord isn't going to be right there with you, mm -hmm. walking through it with you. Mm -hmm. Romans, uh, go to Romans now. We're going to look in Romans, the eighth chapter, We're going to look at three verses. Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? Mm -hmm. If God be for us, who can be against, who can against, us? Be against us? All right, Romans 8, 35. And I like this. Who shall or what shall mm -hmm. separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, great tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Mm. Now, in the New King James Version, it says, Yet in all these things, verse 37, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. But here's what the King James Version says. When the question is asked, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Mm -hmm. It says, shall, shall all of these things, nakedness, persecution, uh, famine, peril or sword, it says, nay. Nothing, Danny, can separate right. us from them. No, yet in all these things, we are the conquerors. We are more than conquerors. Amen. We are the overcomers. We've read the end of the book. We know that no matter what we have to walk through, he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Yeah. He will go through it. Nothing but our own rebellion and disobedience mm, is good. able to separate us from mm, the love. Do I believe in once saved, always saved? You know what? I do only under these conditions <laughs> that you walk uprightly before God. <laughs> but if you make a choice that you Rebel, want yeah. to yeah. walk away from God, yes, it's, mm. it, it, it's, it's, yeah. you can. You That's can good. turn loose of it. Whether now or in the end times, Nothing can separate us from the love of our Savior. That doesn't mean that we're spared pain, trials, or even yeah. death. Yeah. Let me make this statement. Mm -hmm. Many who were more righteous than any of us were martyred. Wow. Mm -hmm. They were martyred mm -hmm. in our history past. Mm -hmm. However, we must not be short-sighted. This is not all there is. Mm -hmm. There is, I, I, like, I like Jeremiah 29, 11. How many of you like that Amen. scripture? Mm -hmm. We've got... Yeah a future and a hope. This Amen. isn't all there is. Mm -hmm. There's a future and there's a hope. 
as we remain faithful. Mm -hmm. Now, CA said, as we surrender to God, mm -hmm. as we remain faithful, an eternity is ours in the very presence of God. I want to end with this one scripture, 2 Timothy 4, 8. Finally, there is laid up for me, for us, mm -hmm. the crown of righteousness, mm -hmm. which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. All right. And not to me only, but also to every one of you that love mm -hmm. his appearing. Amen. Thank you, Molly. Sue, yeah. history will repeat history itself. History will repeat mm -hmm. itself. My lesson is Thursday, the law and the gospel. And as I've been listening to you all, it just occurred to me that part of the great controversy, there's a controversy in the Christian church, and it is between the law and the gospel. Mm -hmm. And what we've got to remember is that the unifying mm -hmm. theme of Scripture is that God is a covenant maker and a covenant keeper. And each one of His covenants, beginning back in Genesis 3.15 and all the way through, each one of His covenants builds on the one before. His covenants are a progressive revelation of his plan of salvation. So what my lesson asks us to do today is to look at a few scriptures to see how closely the law and the gospel are linked. And you know, the good news of the gospel is this, that Jesus Christ came to earth to destroy sin in our life, to reconcile us to God. He saved us by His love, by His mm -hmm. grace, by His mercy. But let's look at Romans 1.18 is where we are going to begin because this tells us something about the nature of God. Romans 1.18 and the scripture reads, and, and let me say this before y'all are still turning. When you think about the law of God and the gospel of God, what is the foundation of both? God's love. God's love. Mm -hmm. the, the law of God is the law of love. Mm -hmm. And it is, that's why it is so closely linked to the gospel, mm -hmm. which is his plan of salvation of love. Okay, Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all what? Ungodly. Ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Mm. Mm. Wow, I could preach on that one, but we don't have time. <laughs> the main thing is that God's nature is one of perfection, moral perfection. Yeah. He is sinless. He hates sin. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible says that God is a consuming fire. That fire is His love. And Sin cannot stand in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. He abhors sin. That's good. So what we need is Christ as our substitute mm -hmm. and our surety. Mm -hmm. God is, however, just, and He cannot let willful rebellion, people who are breaking His commandments, stubborn people who reject His law of love, he cannot let them go unpunished. He can't ignore that. So it tells us in this scripture that those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, those stubborn people who distort the truth and reject the truth will experience the wrath of God. Mm. And, when, and that's going to happen when he destroys sin in the end. Now, I want to jump down to Romans chapter 3 because we're going to try to take this time. I hope I have enough time to look at verses 20 through 26, because this is so amazing. Romans 3, 20 through 26. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. When Paul says, therefore, it's a bridge to everything he said all the way back to chapter one and up yes. to now, he's talked about the wrath of God against ungodliness and unrighteousness. He's talked about the righteousness of God that we all need, whether you are a Gentile or a Jew or a moralist, we all need God's righteousness, the whole world does. And when he says, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. In the Greek, there's no definite article the is missing. So it should really read, by the deeds of law, no flesh will be justified. And basically, 
that means any law. There is absolutely no law that can save us. Mm -hmm. Now, when we think of God's law, it defines sin for us, does it not? And, and it's promises of what God will do to keep us out of sin. It's kind of like if, if you've got a backyard and you fence it in and say, okay, you can run in this, you know, all of these acreage, but don't go beyond that fence. But even though the law is, is defining sin, it cannot free us from sin. I want to read something from the Seventh-day Adventist commentary. I love this statement. Righteousness by works of law has been the basis of every false religious mm -hmm. system. Very true. That's true. And had become the principle even of the Jewish religion. Mm -hmm. But works performed to any law, whether that law be made known by reason, conscience, or revelation, cannot justify a sinner before God. That's why Christ had to die for us. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. We had to go before the Lord for this divine provision mm -hmm. of righteousness. Mm -hmm. Now let's look at Romans 3, 21, continuing. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, because every one of God's covenants builds on the next, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Now, let me stop before we go on with the next verse. The righteousness of God is Jesus Christ himself. He made him who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, to become sin for us. And 1 Corinthians 1, 30 says that he is our wisdom from God, our righteousness, mm. our redemption. He's our sanctification. So the only kind of righteousness there is, is righteousness by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. He says it was witnessed by the law and the prophets. When you think of all of the sacrificial offerings of the Old Testament, they were bearing witness that man had faith mm. in a righteousness that was not inside of himself. It was an external righteousness. And, and he had faith to believe that God had provided this method. Mm -hmm. And see, it all depicted Jesus. And we're going to get into that one of the lessons. Uh, everything about the sanctuary depicted Jesus. But now he goes on and he says in verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. All of us. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are. We've all sinned. Mm. I don't care how great you think you are or, okay. or how bad you think we are. If, mm -hmm. if you think you're great and never sin, you're wrong. Mm. If you think that you're too low of a sinner, too bad of a sinner that God can't save you, mm. you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> but he says this, we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption mm. that is in Christ Jesus. Mm. When you think of falling short of the glory of God, who is the glory of God? Jesus Christ, he came. We all fall short of his character, do we not? Mm -hmm. But it, he says we're justified freely. This is without mm. having to meet any prior conditions. We don't deserve to be justified. And, and let me tell you something. Don't ever think that you're going to help God save you. You can't have merit and grace because it, our, we were so deep in our debt of sin that if God hadn't sent Jesus, we would never have been justified. Ah, yeah. okay. Justification means that more than God has forgiven us. It means that he has pronounced us righteous and acceptable in his sight. And he treats us as if we had never been sinned. So we were bought at the price, ransomed through Christ Jesus. So let me see if I can get one more in. Romans 3, 25, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that God might be both the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God set forth a propitiation. When you think of the Ark of the Covenant, yes. 
-hmm. What was over the ark? I mean, mercy. inside the ark were the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Above the ark was the mercy seat. In the Septuagint, when they translated mercy seat, the Septuagint was the Greek rendering of the Old Testament. When they transferred that into Greek, the word they used for mercy seat was the place of propitiation. Mm. That's right. Mm. Jesus is our propitiation. Amen. So the good news is that mercy triumphs law. The okay. good news mm -hmm. is you. that although we've all sinned, mm -hmm. the, that we will be forgiven through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And the even better news is that he gives us the power to obey the law. So there's just one thing I want to add, and I know our time is, is running out, but obedience to the law is not legalism. Obedience to the law is merely the outgrowth of our love for God. Mm -hmm. Amen. That it, we are motivated by yeah. salvation, Amen. by our love to serve Him and obey Him. Amen. Amen. Thank you so Beautiful. much, each one of you. What an incredible God we serve. In the midst of this great controversy, in the midst of this sin, He sent Jesus, fully human, fully divine, to be the perfect life, the perfect sacrifice for you and for me. Amen. We just have a couple Amen. moments left. Let's take a few seconds of peace and share a closing thought on your day. Pastor C.A. Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, Mm. which is also in Christ Jesus, not just in here, but in here, so that you can live out the will and way of God in your own life. Amen. The warning message of the three angels is a revelation of God's love for fallen man and a way out. Amen. No matter what circumstance or situation you find yourself in, just know this, he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you. Mm. He's always with you, even until the end. Amen. I would think Romans 6, 16, it says, mm. essentially, we are agents of free will, but we are slaves to whom we obey. Mm -hmm. Either we obey sin leading to death or we obey the obedience uh, uh, to God, which leads to righteousness. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you all yeah. so much for sharing from your heart, from the Word of God and from your experience. It's a blessing. Mm -hmm. And we want to thank you for joining us as well at home. I want to close with the last paragraph from the book, The Great Controversy. This tells us how the conflict ends. The Great Controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. Mm -hmm. The entire universe is clean from the minute Adam to the greatest world. All things declare that God is love. God loves you. Accept him as your personal savior. Bye-bye.